I'm Ross Bailey. I'm the director at the University Centre for Rural Health, and I'd like to welcome everybody who's joined so far to um, to the seminar. This uh, this seminar is one of a, a regular seminar series that we have, which is a, a collaboration between the University Centre for Rural Health, Southern Cross Uni. Um, the Northern New South Wales Local Health District and North Coast Primary Health Network. And we're very fortunate, privileged today to have uh, Professor John Waddell um, talking with us. I expect many of you will know that he's recently joined Southern Cross University as the uh, Professor of Public Health and Director of the National Centre for Naturopathic uh, Medicine. So, um, John, great to have you here. We'll, um, we'll start by uh, acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we live and work here in northern New South Wales and the Northern Rivers, which um, the people of the Bundjalung Nation and specifically here in Lismore, <coughs> the uh, Widjibal Wawa people and pay respect to elders. Um, for the seminar, we're going to, um, because of the numbers, we, and just to keep manageable, we're going to keep everybody on mute, except John, of course, when he's, uh, when he's speaking. And um, John will be sharing his screen to show the slides. If people have questions or comments, then please put them into the, into the chat function on, on Zoom. And, uh, We'll, um, I'm expecting we'll have some time at the end for questions and we'll, uh, I'll relay the questions to John and, and John can answer them as we, as we go. So um, we'll just see how many questions come in and we'll get through as many as we can at the end. Um, the, um, the next seminar we have, just to let people know is, um, and ask people to put it in your diaries, is on the 20th of August with uh, Dr. Ed Jehosothi, who <coughs> works with us. He's got a shared appointment. He um, has expertise in environmental health. He works as a combined position with the UCRH and uh, Sydney University School of Public Health. Um, the exact topic will be confirmed um, via our email networks, but I can assure you that it'll be something in that area of environmental health. Um, so without further ado, um, I will uh, hand over to John. Thanks, John. Thank, thank you, Ross. Um, and I'd just like to extend um, uh, my acknowledgement of country just to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on, uh, upon whose land I'm um, uh, speaking from today. Uh, and I guess um, as an extension to everyone else who is uh, uh, viewing in from other areas to the traditional custodians and, and uh, owners of, of, um, of, of their local lands as well. Um, just this, this, this topic in particular, I also think it's good to extend um, the acknowledgement to the knowledge base upon which we often um, rely on in, in complementary and traditional medicine uh, in regards to Indigenous uh, perspectives and, uh, and knowledge bases from uh, Australia, but also the world over. So um, today I am uh, speaking about the interface between complementary medicine and rural primary health care. So there will be a lot of, um, I guess, potential tangents that we can go off in, in, in this particular subject. Um, I'm, I thought it would be best to, to I guess, focus on how uh, complementary medicine um, uh, interfaces with primary care uh, in, in rural areas more because that's probably most relevant to what people are, are looking for. I'm assuming most people here aren't complementary medicine practitioners. I'm assuming there's a mix of well, complementary medicine practitioners, conventional medical providers, allied health providers, and, um, and other people who work in the health support services. So um, today, uh, a brief overview of what we'll be looking at. Um, I'll be giving a brief description about what complementary medicine is, because it is and isn't a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Uh, I'll give a bit of an overview of, of complementary medicine and rurality, um, including some of our work and some, some work of some other people. 
uh, just to give an overview on some insights more generally about how complementary medicine in rural areas um, uh, is, is embraced by the population and by other practitioners in those populations. Uh, then I'll be looking at some of the work that we've actually done ourselves. So um, we'll be looking at some qualitative work on um, uh, rural Queensland naturopaths, specifically the Darling Downs. Um, I'll just give a brief overview of, of, of some survey results that are of significance from rural uh, New South Wales GPs. So um, quite, quite a while ago now, actually, we, um, we surveyed every GP in rural New South Wales. Uh, we did get a 40% response rate, so not everyone answered, but that's a, a reasonably good uh, response rate. Um, obviously, there are a lot of things in there that weren't specific to um, the rural nature of that um, of that question. So a lot of just, you know, generic referral and, and, and use data, but we'll be looking at the rural um, data specifically. Uh, then we'll be looking at um, some of the results of the qualitative work we've done in rural, with new, rural New South Wales GPs and rural uh, GPs or family physicians as they are in, um, in Washington state in the US. Um, and then we'll just be looking at a few key takeaways uh, from there. So before we do get started, I thought it would be good to uh, start out with just discussing what complementary medicine actually is. Um, uh, some of these pictures I've tried to make relevant. This is a, a picture of a, um, uh, the raw product being used for a, a product that we're trialling in Brisbane at the moment on St John's Wort for post-hepatic neuralgia. But I've, um, it's probably good just to explain briefly what complementary medicine actually is to give a, a, a bit of context to, to this talk. Um, one of the things that drives, I guess, academics working in this space a little bit are um, a little bit bananas is, is that complementary medicine is, is quite unique in that it's defined by exclusion, not by inclusion. So it's a very loosely based um, group of uh, practices that are defined by essentially not being incorporated already into uh, the broader health system. So, you know, they're defined by what they're not rather than what they, what they are. Um, I've, I've put up a few uh, um, things that come up when you search for complementary medicines in PubMed, uh, you know, there are things that you probably expect, uh, you know, acupuncture, herbal medicine, osteopathy, massage, um, a few things that you probably won't expect. So, you know, you can get things like muesli, uh, different food fads that can come up. Um, I remember beetroot juice um, being um, listed as a complementary medicine in, in, in one of the earlier Australian um, uh, studies, as well as underdone, uh, undercooked meat. Um, uh, but, you know, there's a lot of... Uh, other issues, so, you know, vitamins, for example, if, if we're looking at somebody who's just taking a multi multivitamin as a, as a insurance sort of um, mechanism supplement, uh, is that the same as someone actually taking a specific vitamin for a specific condition? You know, should that be included in the complementary medicine use or not? Uh, there are some religious elements that are coming through. Um, increasingly, obviously, local, um, probably quite relevant locally uh, with the universal medicine movement um, there, but also there, there's a lot of work in Scientology, for example, trying to rebrand itself as a complementary medicine treatment, uh, particularly in countries where its religious status has been taken away. So, you know, this um, is a very loose, uh, loosely defined group of activities that are, you know, frankly, there's a lot of fringe therapies included with therapies that probably do warrant further examination for inclusion and everything in between. Uh, if you look at the World Health Organization, um, they try and split complementary medicine and traditional medicine um, up uh, into different categories. Uh, the, um, the key difference is obviously uh, traditional is usually culturally based, so uh, based on the traditions of the local um, or indigenous cultures of that, of, of that particular country um, uh, and are usually in integrated or incorporated as such. So this obviously creates some confusion as well. If you think of something like Chinese medicine or Ayurveda, Chinese medicine is traditional in China, uh, it would be complementary medicine in um, Australia. Um, there are differences of definition in terms of alternative medicine, complementary medicine, and integrative medicine. Uh, alternative medicine is uh, when, you know, these therapies are used in place of conventional medicine. It's generally um, discouraged uh, as much as it can. And, and to be honest, it, it does not reflect the majority of how these things are actually used. So um, less than 5% of, of all um, complementary medicines would be used in this particular way. Um, when used as an adjuvant to conventional treatments, generally considered uh, complementary medicine, uh, when actually combined with a uh, deliberate and um, active approach, is classed as integrative medicine. Uh, 
most uses self-directed and patient controlled. And I think this is one of the things, this is one of the things I really like about complementary medicine or, or studying complementary medicine. It's, um, it is a completely almost purely patient driven phenomenon. So, you know, these, these um, therapies and practices are often um, used by the public at pretty significant levels. Uh, often in, in despite barriers or, or non-inclusion in health systems. So uh, by studying complementary medicines, you can actually learn a lot about what patient preferences are, you know, what patients desire from their health and what their, um, uh, what their specific um, preferences and, 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 and non-preferences may be in terms of healthcare delivery. Uh, in saying that, there is just extraordinary heterogeneity between and within complementary medicines. So um, obviously there are very, very big differences between a, a well-regulated practitioner group with, 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 you know, four or five years university training uh, like Chinese medicine and, um, and a, uh, a self-professed healer um, using uh, herbs of dubious origin. Uh, but also within complementary medicine, there can be quite significant differences. So we see this in chiropractic, for example, between what they call the straights and the mixes. Um, mixes tend to be more integrative, focus on musculoskeletal conditions, um, and work uh, with other uh, health practitioner groups, the straights, which are form about 25% of that particular group, um, uh, believe that all, all, all disease you know, comes from um, the spine and can be, be treated with spinal manipulation. And so this is where you see things like uh, um, some of the, I guess, problematic claims in chiropractic about immunity, uh, which are currently coming up with COVID come from. So uh, it is a very interesting group. Uh, it's certainly not a Stay, uh, stay, uh, there's not, not a lot of stasis or, um, or stability within that definition. Um, so that is actually something to, to bear in mind when you do think about complementary medicine. Again, uh, some, more, um, uh, some more contextual things here. Um, I've, I've actually put a lot of slides into this talk and I, I've put them in there usually because people like to keep the slides afterwards for future reference. So um, if I do miss some, some points in here, they, they have been put um, in these slides as, as much so people can actually look at them after as much as um, actually going through them now. These are just some additional uh, examples of some of those different um, uh, complexities. Um, complementary medicine is often seen in a positive um, point of view in terms of its holism, its preventive nature, its ideological, uh, sorry, um, its individualized uh, approach to treatments, which are its shared, I guess, categories. Um, the flip side to this is it can actually be um, negative in, 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 if, if, if delivered improperly or, or if um, delivered by um, uh, untrained uh, or, or, or otherwise um, non-well-meaning uh, practitioner groups. So, um, you know, one of the flip sides to patient empowerment uh, can obviously be victim blaming. So, um, you know, you have control over your own health can turn very easily into you're not getting better because you're not doing it right or you're not taking these things seriously enough quite easily. Um, it is um, theoretically holistic, but uh, not always necessarily uh, practiced in this way. And we see a lot of protocol or, or shotgun treatment um, in um, some elements of the, the complementary medicine community, certainly not the majority of elements. Um, and it can be dogmatic and non-integrative sometimes too. And we do see this with some practitioner groups. Um, there's a really great Gerton Coburn quote here, um, where our marginalization of some groups can uh, create further marginalization whereupon marginalized groups take on doctrines that are irrelevant to their uh, philosophical basis, um, purely for the sake of opposition. So, you know, we do see that sometimes, for example, of um, opposing effective medical treatment for opposition's sake. Um, in many cases, this is often not necessarily because of the background of the complementary medicine itself, but usually because people who are um, skeptical, I guess, of, of conventional medicine usually find themselves attracted to um, other other forms of care. Uh, and again, uh, issues of false legitimacy can come up as well. We do see this in some of our research where um, a health food store employee or, or, or a complementary medicine practitioner is assumed to have a, a greater degree of training um, or qualification than they may actually have. Um, again, uh, on the flip side to that, it is a complex issue. It's not as simple to say that um, Complementary medicine is just medicine that doesn't work. Uh, there are a lot of um, social, ideological, cultural issues that I think really do need to come into play here. And, um, you know, we, we, we've seen from research, for example, that herbal medicines with equal effectiveness just don't get taken up 
as often as, as pharmaceutical medicines by conventional medical providers, even um, when included in the healthcare system. Uh, the worldwide ban of carver is a really good example of, um, I guess, a difference in, in, in safety profile um, expectations between traditional and um, pharmaceutical medicines. Uh, that's only coming back on board now, even though it had a lower risk profile than its pharmaceutical equivalents, it was actually banned rather than actually um, restricted in, in, in probably more appropriate ways, such as behind the counter or something like that. Um, the survey that we're actually going to present today, one of the interesting findings we found from that was more than a, th a third of Australian GPs would refuse to use a herbal medicine product regardless of evidence. Um, and we do see a lot of debate, I guess, in the language of, of, of traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine um, versus conventional medicine. Um, I use irritable bowel syndrome as a example. Um, if you look at the World Health Organization uh, programs in standardizing traditional Chinese medicine terminology, it's, it's actually, you know, these are functionally based diagnoses, not, not dissimilar in the way that the DSM or IBS um, may be defined using the own criteria. Um, the NIH, the US NIH, uh, defines complementary medicines in, in, in three primary groups. Um, which are often used for, I guess, easy uh, categorization. Uh, so uh, natural products, uh, mind and body practices, and what they call traditional medical systems. So uh, quite a, a, a whirlwind overview, because I, I do realize we don't have a lot of time, but um, just a probably important context for what we're talking about when we do talk about complementary medicine, because it is a um, large group of practices a large group of therapies and um, regionally very different uh, to, uh, in terms of their uptake, uh, their acceptance and their utilization. Uh, so now we're just gonna go through some of the um, general overview of some of the, of the, the data on, uh, the, the evidence on complementary medicine and rurality. So um, this, this review, which is actually a little bit old now, <laughs> probably should be updated um, again, but, but we've been keeping tabs and updating relatively regularly, but the, the results have not changed uh, too much. Uh, international evidence suggests, uh, so I'm going to have to look at my slides here because I've got the, the Zoom thing right in the way of uh, those notes. Um, international evidence is uh, pretty clear in um, showing that uh, complementary medicine use is higher in rural areas than, than, than urban areas. Uh, and that this is actually not a lack, due to a lack of conventional medical resources, which is one of the big assumptions before this review actually came out, that this was the primary driver, that people couldn't see conventional uh, services or allied health services that were um, integrated within the system, so they're using whatever else was around. Um, the data pretty consistently shows that's just not true. Uh, there's actually a cultural affinity, um, and there's, there are social and cultural reasons underlying this use. Uh, patients tend to use complementary medicine even when um, that area is well served by conventional options. And um, although our specific study didn't show this, uh, generally uh, international data seems to show if anything, uh, complementary medicine um, practitioner distribution tends to follow conventional medicine um, and allied health practitioner distribution more than anything else. So in other words, if, if areas are well served by conventional uh, medical services, they'll also be well served by, by complementary medicine services. Uh, Rural populations will tend to drive large distances for complementary medicine services rather than, their, um, uh, rather than uh, just relying on them being in their immediate locale. And the average patient travel distance was 25 miles from naturopaths in the US. Uh, in Australia, it was over 50 kilometers. So, um, you know, these are things that have been actively sought by rural populations, um, even if not in the immediate area. So uh, it's not a passive choice in the, in, in the sense that they can't get into other services, but um, which was you know, one of the key underlying assumptions. And I've, I've, I've put this up um, here. This is a, a review of African uh, traditional complementary medicine use because those, those same assumptions were based internationally in developing countries as well as developed. And what we're finding is the difference between developed and developing countries in terms of the social and cultural drivers for um, complementary medicine use are, are pretty much uh, identical. So, um, there are some similarities across the urban rural divide. So um, in both urban and rural areas, higher complementary medicine use if they're female, uh, have a higher education, have a higher income, or have um, chronic disease or multimorbidity. Um, I should probably note these are pretty common across most health services, not necessarily just complementary medicine. Um, Self-prescribed complementary medicine use is more common than practitioner use. Um, 
Uh, but all types of complementary medicine use are higher in rural areas. Uh, it, complementary medicine use tends to be less product focused in, in, in rural areas. This is often because the um, access to uh, health food store and pharmacy products um, just is not there. So there are often uh, other alternatives that are given. So um, a lot of lifestyle uh, dietary and other prescriptions are usually provided by, by complementary medicine groups in those areas. And there is a lot of um, physical medicine, uh, complementary medicine practitioner groups, chiropractors, osteopaths that, that form a lot of this. Um, generally not used instead of conventional care, usually used in combination. Uh, but interestingly, uh, most patients will not disclose this um, use to either, they won't disclose their complementary medicine use to their conventional providers and they won't disclose their medical treatment with complementary medicine providers. So, you know, uh, patients tend to want to keep those two worlds separate, um, which of course is, is highly problematic for a number of reasons. Uh, and the ethnic differences between complementary medicine use are roughly equal to, to, to what we see in urban populations. Um, in terms of the services provided, um, rural complementary medicine services are busier and have a larger primary point of care role than, than, than often observed in urban areas. So, um, what this means is that um, in rural uh, areas, uh, complementary medicine providers are usually um, a first point of call, not just a specialised point of call. Uh, there's higher referral um, to, to complementary medicine in rural medicine. In, in New Zealand, for example, it's one and a half times higher, but there's a number of other studies uh, across the um, Australia and, and other countries that show this as well. Uh, lay practitioners and folk cures are important, uh, do play an health, important healthcare role in rural populations. So. Um, people who are known, not necessarily by qualification, but for the results um, in getting different treatments um, are quite important in, uh, are, are quite important healthcare players in, in, in many rural regions. Um, we see this a little bit in culturally and linguistically diverse communities in urban areas, but um, this seems to be a uh, population-wide phenomenon in rural areas. Uh, and again, not associated with lack of conventional care. Uh, that study was a bit old, so I've just tried, uh, put in um, this updated study, which is a, a review of Australian um, studies on complementary medicine utilisation more generally. Again, pretty consistent here. Uh, manual therapy, so chiropractic and naturopathy really, really dominate uh, rural provision of care in, in, in Australia, um, even in remote areas. So, um, so, you know, what we tend to see is that even remote areas, we usually have higher use of complementary medicine practitioners as well as products. There's, uh, as, um, as, uh, as seen in urban areas. Um, for chiropractic, it's pretty consistent nationally. For other complementary medicines, uh, there is mixed data. So nationally it's higher, but some regions don't necessarily have more significant use uh, and it can be condition specific. Um, so uh, urban, urban, um, in, in, you know, urban studies show that um, naturopathy is pretty um, uh, significantly higher for osteoarthritis than in rural areas, and uh, which is interesting because that's not necessarily a, a, a finding that you'd find a lot of naturopaths working in. Uh, one of the uh, other interesting findings is that users on lower income are more likely to use complementary medicine in rural areas than urban areas. So there is an income gradient, but it's not as severe as it would be in urban areas. Um, one of our um, members um, uh, at the naturopathic uh, at, at, at the center, NCNM, Naturopathic Center, uh, Cent National Center for Naturopathic uh, Medicine, uh, Matthew Leach, has um, probably done the most recent study in Australia of drivers of rural use. Um, this is narrowed. Uh, this is focused on um, a regional South Australian population, but again, showing those same things uh, that we were showing before. So. Um, Negative experiences uh, with conventional care are usually likely to drive patients to complementary medicine. Um, Multimorbidity is associated with higher use. These things are probably, I guess, um, well known. People who have healthy behaviours generally are more likely to use complementary medicine. And there is increasing complementary medicine use the higher the level of rural, uh, rurality, except for remote. So um, remote just drops off a little bit from uh, of very remote, sorry, so very remote, just, just a little bit from remote, but um, but uh, but but not by much. Uh, and even even those patients with scepticism of the complementary medicine principles and practices themselves um, are more likely to use complementary medicine than urban populations. So um, as we get into the qualitative data, you'll see some of this come coming in in terms of the you know the um, the impact of word of mouth and um, the results. Um, 
you know, that, that concept of rural practice where, you know, you see your mistakes on the street, um, you see your patients uh, on the street uh, coming through. Um, I've just put in there as well, one of the assumptions that traditionally was taken up was the fact that um, rural populations are older and that might actually have a, um, uh, uh, an impact on complementary medicine use in these areas. But, but what we're actually finding is that differential is actually increasing uh, with um, Gen X and millennials um, as well. So uh, not only are rural populations more likely to use complementary medicine in urban areas, um, they're becoming increasingly more likely um, uh, as, 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 um, as, 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 uh, as, as the demographics change. Um, there is pretty significant distribution of complementary medicine practitioners throughout um, Australia. So this is um, a study we did of, of, of New South Wales. We're actually, we've actually just um, done this nationally as well. So we're just uh, making these nice maps uh, currently actually, um, which will be really exciting to get them out. But, you know, um, these uh, complementary medicine practitioners are actually um, pretty substantially distributed throughout most of um, most of mo most of um, Australia, uh, New South Wales, or rural areas in particular, uh, as you can see, uh, chiropractors and naturopaths will dominate, uh, and the region, uh, the Northern Rivers region, is quite um, well served by by most practitioner groups, as you can probably see. Um, and again, uh, complementary medicine practitioners uh, providers exist at pretty much all levels of rurality and independently of. Um, provision of, 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 of other healthcare services, uh, which indicates that, um, uh, you, know, um, you know, which may indicate that this is an active decision to use um, these therapies in, in, in rural health, um, because the um, distribution tends to follow demand rather than actually driving it. Uh, so just give you a brief overview of why this might actually be uh, in play. Um, so this is this is our Hobart's oldest pharmacy that we have a relationship with, which is now a, actually a herbal pharmacy. Um, but one of the things I do want to get a, a, a across is a lot of people think um, that complementary medicine is a, is, a, is a new age phenomenon. And this is a uh, another assumption that is very hard to, I guess, um, uh, change uh, the perception of. Um, uh, I've included here a um, uh, both a, a, an article from from a, a rural newspaper in in 1905, actually advertising naturopath, a, a visiting naturopath as a sign of a rural town success. Uh, the fact that they're able to attract this um, unorthodox practitioner. Um, but this book, Paradise of Quacks by Philip Amada, is a really interesting history of um, Australian medicine more generally. Um, uh, you know where she discusses how you know uh, Australia, the Australian medical system built up through. Um, a system of competing medical paradigms, much the same that, uh, much the, in, in much the same way that the US um, did, and the dominance of conventional med medicine as as the competing par dominant paradigm was not necessarily um, assumed. And actually, if you look at work like by Hans Baer, for example, um, you know he talks about um, you know naturopathy, uh, you know um, certainly being co-opted in some ways by the, by the new age and, and, and natural medicine movement, but been in existence for a long time before that. He talked about it when the straight back nature cure adherence um, met with the flower children. But um, so certainly there is a element of that, but in, in rural practice, it tends to follow this more, I guess, conventional, traditional, conservative um, mode of practice. Uh, and just to give you an example, um, you know, here, here's um, the earliest mention of a naturopath I could actually find in Lismore, which was our advertised uh, ad advertisement, advertisement for a naturopath um, practicing in, in Magellan Street um, in 1904 in the Northern Star. Um, but there are a number of reasons for this. Um, again, this is a lot of information that is actually here, but generally the organization uh, and institutions that did come to Australia tended to ignore, I guess, local traditions of, 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 of lay treatment and, 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 and folk treatment. Um, you know, the development of the medical profession as an institution was quite slow. Um, the, you know, it's medically pluralistic from the start. So, um, you know, homeopathy, herbal medicine, um, the eclectics, the Thomsonians, um, and Chinese medicine actually has been in Australia for, for a long, long, long time, uh, to the extent that um, up to a quarter of all herbalists um, in the 19th century were actually Chinese uh, or Asian um, in, in, in nature. So there have been a, a number of different conventional and complementary medicine um, practices actually um, 
competing for, you know, e ever since the, um, the, the settlement of Australia started. So um, new settlers brought with them new medical traditions. So there was a, a great influx of, of, of different uh, medical traditions um, coming to Australia. This is not too dissimilar to what happened in, in um, the North American uh, model of medical, med uh, what they call medical pluralism. Um, in rural areas, it was particularly prominent because the reach of the medical institutions were very urban focused in the, in the early history of Australia. Um, what this meant was the reach of the, um, then the British Medical Association of Australasia uh, and its precursors really extended beyond the capitals. Um, so while uh, traditional and complementary medicines were driven out to some extent of, of the major cities, they were largely ignored in, in rural areas and they did establish themselves in rural areas. Uh, standards were more relaxed, particularly um, when state, um, state and public health departments were um, enlisting, uh, you know, vaccinators, for example. So a lot of Thompsonian eclectic, um, who are, I guess, precursors of the naturopathic communities, are uh, foreign trained who, um, including Asian uh, and Indian trained um, practitioner groups, as well as uh, Central European who are often homeopathic in their training. Um, were allowed to practice in, in, in rural areas and were actually employed by, by the government in areas where they probably would not be allowed to practice um, elsewhere. And this actually meant that the rural areas tend to be seen as a growth area uh, for a lot of complementary medicine practices uh, in Australia. Um, for many emerging complementary medicine practitioners, this was, um, uh, you, know, you know, there was a growth, um, it, it, rural areas were seen as an opportunity for growth. And I, I guess the, the key takeaway that I wanna um, put here is that uh, Complementary medicine has been in, in rural Australia, in some cases, for longer than conventional medicine has. So there is a very, very deep historical and social connection with it. Uh, so with that context in mind, um, I do want to um, look at some of the data that we've actually, um, you know, some of the actual studies that we've actually done just to um, give you an overview of uh, the work we've done currently, um, and which will hopefully be built on um, with our new centre. Um, at SCU, uh, so one of the one of the things that we uh, did initially was we, um, and again these these studies are a few years old now, but um but but they are still um, insightful in, in what they actually provide about um, complementary medicine practice and interface in in, in rural areas. So. Um, so we did a study of uh, 20 naturopaths practicing in the Darling Downs region, uh, a few in Toowoomba, but largely in, 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 in um, the, the, the smaller towns. So again, um, you know, the things that we identified before, they're generally busier, uh, more of a primary um, care generalist um, uh, practitioner group than, than, than others. Um, the practitioners themselves talked about themselves as being pragmatic rather than new age, which is probably a nice um, way to describe it. Um, uh, but also, you know, um, when, when identifying why practitioners were actually drawn to them, the perceptions of why, why, why patients in rural areas were seeing their, you know, seeking their services, um, strong historical connections were identified. Um, uh, you know, so some of the founding fathers of naturopathy, uh, you know, were from out there, the culture was still seen to be alive. Um, one of the key drivers for practice, and, you know, we did talk about how practice was quite different. Uh, whether costs were a larger barrier in practice than in urban practice uh, than, than in urban areas. Um, one of the interesting things, and I think this come across consistently in our patient, our CAM practitioner, and our, our conventional, our GP studies, um, is this idea of foreign doctors. And by foreign doctors, I don't mean international medical graduates or something like that. I mean someone who is not from the local area or hasn't um, embedded themselves within the local area. So, um, uh, so you know, um, you know, rather than someone from, you know, who's been flown in from Adelaide or Sydney or Brisbane to, to you know, treat a local community for, for a few years, they, um, most, most complementary medicine practitioners were from those communities. Um, they went back to the communities after they, they studied in, 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 um, in, in the cities um, and they started um, embedding themselves, investing um, and actually building links within those communities. So, you know, they were members of Rotary, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, Again, when we actually looked at if there, you know, when we asked them if there was anything about rural um, populations that perhaps um, made them um, seek naturopathic uh, services, particularly when, you know, the, the underlying assumptions are that they wouldn't, 
Um, so, you know, there's an idea that naturopathic medicine fit with the stoicness and the independence of, um, of, of rural populations. So, you know, uh, if, if you look at a lot of the practice studies that we've done recently, there's a lot of um, self-care, lifestyle medicine, education uh, focused uh, treatment that, 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 that happens in, in naturopathic um, practice more generally in Australia, but particularly in, in, in rural practice. Um, again, there was this underlying appreciation of holism, <laughs> as long as you didn't call it that. Um, so there was a deep social and cultural connection with the um, philosophical tenets of complementary medicine, you know, which are those sorts of, um, you know, uh, things that we, we, we generally spoken about before, you know, holism, uh, you know, treating the individual, um, having a, um, I guess, a mind-body-spirit approach to, um, to treatment. Uh, but the underlying theories were not necessarily that dwelt upon. And in fact, when, when, when practitioners tried to talk about those theories, they actually found that patients tended to turn off. So a more pragmatic practice was, was the key um, thing there. Um, so looking onto the rural um, New South Wales GP survey, uh, survey, sorry, I've, I spelled that wrong. Um, so again, a, a lot of it was just a general survey, 27 item survey sent to um, uh, GPs practicing in rural areas of New South Wales. Uh, I'll just go very briefly over, you know, what we found here. Um, most, most GPs in, in, in rural New South Wales were referring. Um, so, you know, uh, figure nine here, um, uh, you know, shows how often, uh, figure 10 shows what they were referring to or who they were referring to and um, a table five. Uh, just shows the individual prescriptions that GPs themselves were making. Um, so we did actually extend this to Washington, although we haven't completely gone through the Washington data yet. But um, one thing that was very, very clear from the survey data that we found was that um, people were estimating um, complementary medicine used to be much slower than it actually was. If you compare population data versus patient data, it, it actually is quite a significant uh, uh, difference. Uh, we've seen this in the US and, 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 and in Australia, and we've seen this in, in actually the, um, when we've done a review of, 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 of GP surveys in, 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 in um, with uh, complementary medicine uh, knowledge, perception, and experience of GPs um, surveys internationally as well. It's a consistent finding that GPs tend to underestimate the, the complementary medicine use in their communities. And we think there's a number of reasons for this. Some just don't discuss it with their GPs. Um, and some pay, you know, some, uh, so it just gets lost. But sometimes patients actually feel as though they can't discuss it with their GP as well. And we, we did see that come quite often. And actually, to be honest, in our qualitative work, we found some GPs who, um, you know, were, were quite happy not to discuss that and, and often gave their patients ultimatums. So, you know, either you stop seeing this complementary medicine practitioner, you stop taking this product or you stop seeing me. Um, and you know, we, we've seen some of this with our work on vaccination and some other areas as well. And um, certainly, you know, it, it, there is a, I guess, well-meaning intent from the GPs, but often um, the impact on patient care can be quite deleterious. Um, uh, generally, the net knowledge of uh, general practitioners was, was, was quite low. Um, most general practitioners had some form of relationship with a professional relationship with a CAM practitioner. And we thought this was quite important, particularly in rural areas. This seems to be the case where the GP is more comfortable referring to a chiropractor, even if they're quite skeptical of chiropractic, because they know that particular chiropractor and that particular chiropractor is um, getting results with their patients. So <clears throat> there was sometimes a, um, a disconnect between actual referral and actual um, I guess, our opinion of, of, of various therapies. Um, in terms of the knowledge, um, this is a net knowledge score. So, you know, um, poor knowledge versus good knowledge and an overall score given up. Generally, the traditional medicine systems were the ones that were less well known by um, rural practitioners um, and they felt less comfortable dis discussing with their patients. Uh, and you see this particularly when you look at the difference between something like TCM and uh, traditional Chinese medicine and, and, and acupuncture. Uh, in terms of referrals, uh, the kind of things that you would expect, so, you know, lack of other options and positive results previously were, were key drivers. Um, interestingly, um, professional relationships with the CAM provider actually um, reduced um, referrals to one practitioner group, and we think this is because naturopaths tend to probably be impacted by professional relationships with herbal medicine, nutrition, um, and other, or, or massage or other, other services. Um, 
chiropractors were more likely to be referred to if patients asked about complementary medicine, and this is probably a, a you know um, a factor of the fact that they're actually on um, the enhanced primary care scheme. Uh, and patient requests for referral, um, homeopathy. It, it was actually one of the few cases where homeopathy was actually seen as a uh, active referral could be made. And this was basically a, a um, you know, mo most GPs mentioned this as sort of, um, well, it can't hurt, it can't harm. If they're asking for it, I may as well give it to them, uh, placebo type treatment. So, uh, and again, um, peer review literature um, for homeopathy and mind-body medicine was quite deleterious, but for some reason for naturopathy, um, quite substantially um, improved um, referral, uh, increased referrals, which we're, we're still trying to work out why. For our qualitative studies, um, so this is a this was um, 50 interviews conducted with GPs or family physicians in in Washington State, um, uh, 30 in New South Wales, 20 in Washington, um, were um, chosen based on a screening questionnaire um, from survey respondents. Generally, they were pretty similar across both the US and Australia. The only main difference was um, there seemed to be less competition with with complementary medicine in the US. And I think this probably um, is an indication of the um, the competitive medical situation in America, um, where you know I'm, I'm not worried about the naturopathy of my patients. I'm more worried about about the medical practice down the road, which I think is probably um, something we can discuss about the US medical system <laughs> rather than um, the conventional uh, complementary medicine interface. Uh, so generally, you know, we saw um, three, you know, three main attitudes uh, towards complementary medicine, acceptance, not acceptance, and what we term belligerent tolerance. So um, most of those who accepted were, were generally um, quite uncritical about their acceptance. Um, some non-acceptors were quite uncritical about their um, non-acceptance as well. Uh, but there's also this sort of, you know, where, where, where tolerance existed, it was often... Um, based in the language of risk, you know, as long as it can't harm the patient, I don't. So rather than actually being seen as an active treatment for um, a positive result, it was, it was, it was seen as more um, something that would be based on a, a risk uh, assessment rather than an actual benefit assessment. Uh, interestingly, there was a lot of discussion about um, GPs, you know, when they do talk to about their, their, their complementary medicine patients, a lot of the reasons that they're patients discuss talk, you know, seeing a complementary medicine provider was to um, essentially escape the constraints of um, the medical system that, um, that the GPs, that, that forced the GPs to act in certain ways that perhaps um, the patients did not um, fully appreciate. So, um, you know, more time with patients, you know, building a rapport, um, which, which, which uh, there, was, there was actually quite a bit of jealousy amongst um, some, some GPs uh, with the way that complementary medicine practitioners could practice. Um, interestingly, they said that patients were happy to spend money for complementary medicine treatments than conventional medical treatments, which they, which most patients felt should be provided for free um, by the government. Um, and you know, there, there were some statements like, "I don't like big pharma," so so some um, some 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 uh, patients were, were were making these statements, which is 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 a little ironic because there there, there can be a, a quite a commercial element to many complementary medicine practices as well. Um, doctors were generally accepting of our uh, patients' use of CAM, even if they um, didn't believe it was effective. So again, based in that um, language of risk. Uh, major concerns were um, lack of regulation. Uh, this is actually my favourite quote from that whole thing, which is, a, um, you know, I'm happy, to, I'm happy to refer to a quack as long as it's a regulated quack. Um, sorry, my cut and paste has, has, has made a few um, mistakes here. Uh, and financial exploitation. So they were the two major concerns of... Um, of, of, of our general practitioners when referring to complementary medicine rather than the, um, I guess, the benefits of, of, of the, uh, the treatments themselves. So very much a risk-focused um, point of view. Uh, no real surprise that the highest of complementary medicine by rural populations, again, you know, issues such as inventiveness. Um, the agricultural background was seen as quite, um, um, uh, quite important. So, you know, people actually, you know, uh, when people have a bad crop, they can have bad health and people in, in rural areas often see that, I guess, um, connection between stress and um, uh, mental, mental health and physical health. Um, we did go to one area where there seemed to be a, a, an errant rogue vet um, practicing as a primary healthcare practitioner, which was a bit worrying, but, um, uh, but, um, but you know, there, there, was an, there was an idea that, um, 
you know, country people often didn't like to go see medical practitioners, but they did often learn a lot about health through through other um, other other means, particularly animal husbandry uh, and resor uh, resourcefulness as well. So that self education element of complementary medicine was actually really quite important uh, in terms of driver of use, as seen by patients, care practitioners themselves, and GPs. Um, so less medical practitioner labeling and higher respect for professionals. So, you know, if you, are, if, you, if you are an expert in that area who gets results, you get known as someone who gets results and it doesn't really matter if you're a chiropractor, a GP, a naturopath or, or, um, or an allied health practitioner. Word of mouth and interrelationships were, were incredibly important. Um, the distinctions between professional groups weren't as uh, distinct in, in those areas. So, um, you know, GPs were seeing CAM practitioners as patients and often CAM practitioners were seeing GPs as patients as well. Um, again, uh, you know, the key issue was, um, you know, complementary medicine in rural areas wasn't draped in the new age language that often is in urban areas. And this, this notion of being invested in the community, again, was, was incredibly important. So, um, and something that kept coming up again and again. So one of the key takeaways, the key takeaways, I guess, I want people to, to, to think about, um, you know, even in rural areas, well, generally we like to remind people that, um, you know, your patients are more likely than not to be using a complementary medicine product, uh, more likely than not to be seeing a complementary medicine practitioner, uh, and they're more likely than not to discuss that use with conventional medical providers. And actually vice versa as well, not likely to discuss conventional use with a complementary medicine provider as well. So, um, this creates, you know, some issues. So if you're looking at a herbal medicine like um, St. John's Wort, for example, which acts essentially as a mild SSRI, um, that there is a very real risk of um, non-communication actually creating some direct risk, but there are, you know, just the risks of um, wasting time and, um, you know, competing treatment regimes and that kind of stuff as well, if you don't actually initiate those discussions. Um, one of the things I always like to do um, when I, do the um, the medical um, student education on, on complementary medicine at UQ is, is remind people that a lot of the reasons people use complementary medicine aren't actually that dissimilar. They're, they're, they're not unique to complementary medicine. They're often um, things that could be integrated into any form of care quite easily. And I, I think um, we should probably look at some of these things as well. So, um, but one of the other key takeaways that, that, that we did see from, from, from our work is that it's still often seen as acceptable by some GPs to mock patients cam use and because it is such a personal choice of, of, of patients, um, the way that a GP can approach that cam use um, can actually impact on a, the, how comfortable the patient may feel discussing other potentially stigmatized issues. So the ones in our studies that came up were mental illness, substance abuse, DV and sexual health. Um, so what we try and um, highlight is you don't need to agree with the scene, you know, with the complementary medicine use, but you need to, you know, disagree respectfully and you need to engage in a discussion that's actually not um, providing ultimatums or, or, or providing judgment uh, because the, the studies show if given the choice between a complementary medicine and a GP, the patients usually choose the complementary medicine, which is a potentially significant loss to primary, uh, primary care. Um, again, um, you know, these things that, that, that most GPs would probably really like to see in general practice, but um, we don't see in the system. So, um, you know, uh, a lot of the drivers towards complementary medicine use is really about the relationships, the community role, uh, and, and, you know, things like value for money, like, you know, just the fact of that, that people felt more comfortable talking about their gut health, um, their physical health, uh, you know, their, their musculoskeletal health and, um, and some other uh, issues all in one consultation with a complementary medicine provider than they did with a um, conventional provider. All groups want better communication, but often no uh, official mechanisms exist to actually do this. So, um, this is one of the things that we're certainly trying to look at is, is trying to find a more formal structure for the complementary medicine communities and the general practitioner communities um, and the allied health, the conventional allied health communities to, um, to communicate and work together a lot more because what we find is um, if left to patients, it often just doesn't happen. Uh, and patients are often hesitant to do it because they fear the response of either uh, a complement, you know, a complementary medicine provider um, talking about their pharmaceutical medications or uh, a general practitioner talking about their complementary medicine use. Um, so that's a very, very brief overview. I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions and to share those slides. I, I just want to acknowledge um, several of the co-authors that were uh, on this paper and just the NHMRC, uh, University of Washington and UQ for, for funding a lot of this research as well. 
um, if any of you have any questions or, or you know want to know more about our centre, I've just put up the link um, to our centre there as well. So um, so thank you. Thanks very much, John. That was really interesting. The um, the definition and the vagueness or the nebulousness of the definition is is very is makes it um, interesting, but also challenging. And uh, um, you, I'm interested. Uh, can people please, if you've got any questions, just put them into the into the chat function, and um, I'll get John to address those. And while you're just considering um, thinking about questions, I'll I'll get started with the question that I have, and that is, John, how do you um, how do you see complementary fitting in relation to the evidence based medicine movement? <clears throat> Well, I, I, I think this is um, one of those, you know, points where the nebulousness of the, de of, of the definition makes it quite difficult because there are um, aspects of complementary medicine that, that, that really are now quite evidence-based. Um, so, um, you, know, um, you, know, you know, there's, you know, there, there are things like yoga, for example, which is increasingly had an evidence base for a number of conditions. Uh, you know, some, some of the elements of naturopathy um, which are more, I guess, lifestyle and chronic disease, you know, focused, uh, uh, you know, getting some evidence, some herbal medicines, some nutritional medicines, but there are some, um, you know, th th there are some that just, I don't think ever will have an evidence base um, that, and, and probably sh shouldn't be integrated um, as, as well. So we, we, we tend to try and, um, after explaining what complementary medicine is, we try and tell people to ignore that definition and actually focus on the individual treatments themselves and to, to, to judge them as, you know, as they actually are. Because, um, uh, you know, if you're looking at the, um, you know, uh, there's gonna be a lot of difference between, um, you know, the herbal medicine, St. John's Wort and, and, and mental health conditions versus homeopathic St. John's Wort and mental health conditions, just by virtue of the fact that they're completely different products with completely different um, uh, rationales, treatment regimes, and, and, and that kind of thing as well. So. But what, what, one of the things we have found is even when the evidence does exist, there does seem to be a, that, that, that term complementary medicine, there is a sociological, ideological block almost um, to getting that actually integrated into various treatments. And we've seen that with, um, you know, prescribing data from Europe on various herbal medicines. Um, you know, we've seen that for, um, you know, some, you know, uh, uh, you know, yoga is a really good example of that as well, where there's, there's you know, it, it's actually banned from, from integration, um, even in areas where it does actually have a more substantial evidence base than yeah. support therapies. Yeah, it's, um, um, I see there's still, still no, no other questions, but um, you know, obviously there, there's, some, there's some areas of so-called conventional medicine where the evidence base is pretty thin as well, but it still continues to be widely practiced within conventional medicine circles. And um, so I guess the related question is, at, when, does, when does a complementary medicine become a conventional medicine? Um, mm. Um, and and vice versa. And I mean, when you were talking, about giving the historical pers perspective, uh, it seemed that so-called complementary medicine was actually the dominant system because of the lack of conventional practitioners and lack of access. So, mm. so is that then is 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 complementary medicine then rather the the conventional system and and vice versa? So, Anyway, we do have another question here. Do you have information about whether complementary medicine use is sought for a specific condition that has been diagnosed versus symptoms? So, um, yeah. So, sorry, well, uh, <clears throat> so versus symptomatic relief versus an actual diagnosed condition. Um, so, most, most patients tend to. Yeah, Dr. Google has changed a lot of things um, in, in some cases for the better, but in many cases for the worst. Um, so, so often the diagnosis, um, you know, what, what, once patients have a diagnosis, they generally rely on their practitioner, but for symptomatic treatment, there's a lot of self-care that, 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 does, that, that does sort of go into that um, case as well. And, you know, what we're seeing in, in, 
in a lot of work is it's not necessarily health practitioners that that um, are offering advice on the complementary medicine um, uh, treatments, but there's a variety of, of of lay sources, and and the most influential sources actually aren't practitioners; they're actually family members um, and peers. Um, tend to have a lot more influence in complementary medicine information provision than um, than than, than practitioner groups. So. Um, generally, if there's a diagnosis attached to it, then usually that, that's more likely to be advice from a practitioner simply because the diagnosis itself has come from a practitioner and that's usually where that discussion happens. So, um, but in, in saying that, one of the, you know, there, there actually is quite a, a large body of research now actually just, just showing, just, just simply asking the patients if they are using something um, can really open up that discussion quite, quite substantially because it gives the patient permission to um tell their practitioner about it um and it also um you know starts to you know it, it really you know identifies that as a as, a, as an area that the, the patient and the, the practitioner can start discussing um things about so um if you look at most of the work that's been done on developing information um sources for complementary medicine and the national prescribing service did a big big study on this a couple of years ago they're still very practitioner focused um, and um, un, un, the, the, the patients generally don't go to practitioners for this kind of information. So there's a lot of, um, I think, scope for developing lay sources of information that are actually reliable um, that they can tap into. And there's a lot of, um, um, there's a lot of scope for that, particularly at community pharmacy level, I think. So. Sorry, Ross, you're on, you're on mute. Sorry, I've got a I've got a carpenter with a circular saw outside my window. Which is, <laughs> <laughs> um, Larissa, did you want to uh, make your point? Not my point, but a point. Um, it was just in response to your question about evidence-based care and complementary medicine. Um, I can't speak for all types of um, complementary medicine, but the research that I've just done did show that a lot of maternity care professionals are including what biomedicine or what John today is called conventional medicine would consider evidence-based care. They're recommending, for example, folic acid, another form of the folic acid preconceptually in the first three months based on the, on the scientific evidence, as well as things like iodine supplementation and vitamin D for the health of both the mother and the baby. So there is, um, and that's only one, of course, that's only just maternity care. I just wanted to say that there is a lot of, um, there is a lot of research out there that's showing that complementary medicine practitioners are including evidence-based care in their practice. It's not exclusive to biomedicine and other forms of allied health. Don't know if that answered your question, Ross. <laughs> thanks, 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 Larissa. And 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 actually, there there is actually a lot of work on um, the complementary medicine providers and how they engage with evidence based medicine. Um, so actually, Matthew Leach, who's at our centre, has done a lot of that work. Um, Amy Steele at UTS has done a lot of that work as well in the Australian context. But it's a um, it, it it's quite interesting um, when when people dive into the literature, they're often quite surprised about how much literature there, there is on complementary medicine and. Um, that, that notion that naturopaths are, um, you know, uh, you know, the odds ratio for referral to naturopaths if, if, if peer-reviewed literature is actually the major source of complementary medicine information uh, in there. When, when we did drill down into that, that, that was because people were finding stuff, I guess, outside the usual journals. So, you know, most, most, you know, <laughs> most people get, you know, three or four normal uh, medical journals, generalist medical journals that they look at. Um, uh, but you know, when you when you do a deep dive into PubMed, there's all sorts of um, all sorts of stuff that can come up on some elements of complementary medicine. Not all complementary medicines, but there are several that are quite, um, I, I would term, evidence based now, um, but not necessarily incorporated because they're I guess lost in specialist journals a lot of the time. Um, and we do see, for example, specialist use of complementary medicine is actually quite higher, significantly higher than general practitioner use of of um, complementary medicine uh, and when we when we look at the research for that that's because 
the specialists are often reading the specialist journals that that, that work is actually conducted in. So, um, so I think compiling <laughs> um, this, this, you know, this, this, this evidence base, um, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done on that because there, there is a lot of work out there and it's very easy to just get one part of it rather than the whole picture. Okay, look, we're, um, we're past five o'clock, um, so I'm going to close this off, but I'm sure that John will be happy to follow up with people who, um, who do want to have follow-up discussion or have questions. And John, the slides, you will provide those to us at the UCRH for circulation to everybody. Is that the plan? Uh, yeah, Amy, Amy's already got a copy of them, so. Okay. Right, so we'll send um, we'll send those out to everybody. But um, look, it's been really good to have you do this presentation, and um, and we're looking forward when conditions allow to seeing yeah. you actually <laughs> up here in person. So, I know, I'm, I can't wait to get up there. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank, thanks right. so much, Ross. Thanks, thanks everyone for attending. Thank you. Thanks, John. I just want to say it's so lovely to see you. It's been way too long. And this is oh. Kelly, by the way. Oh, Kelly, hey. <laughs> it's been Has so, been. so long. I did, I did post this into our Yammer at work and saw a few faces that came along, which is great. Thanks to Larissa, yeah. she shared it with me. So, um, love to, yeah, I'll, I'll get the slides and share them for sure. Oh, I'd, I'd love to catch up. Yeah. I hope you're staying safe down there. Yeah, it's an interesting time. Yeah. Tell you what, complementary medicine comes in handy down here. <laughs> it's a whole other research, isn't it? Yeah, no, I bet. <laughs>